So for me personally, as a California native, I'm really interested and curious about what it is that brought you all the way to the West Coast after being a Pembroke native here. Um, uh, I took a job with uh, the uh, uh, Treasury Department and the, uh, then we tried cases for the IRS and uh, first went to Seattle and uh, was cold and chilly. We had small kids and we wanted to go to San Francisco to your place. Little did we know at that time about San Francisco. <laughs> and there was a long queue, and so we wound up going to Los Angeles, and we didn't come back. So as you started out as, um, as a lawyer, what made you stop practicing law and end up into real estate development? Well, I'm tempted to say greed, but, <laughs> but <laughs> probably isn't very <laughs> uh, politically correct. Uh, but I had the uh, opportunity. Uh, I had a. I was practicing tax law, and I had a uh, client who got into tax trouble. Uh, and we worked it out, and uh, he decided he would like for me to join him in real estate development. So I went into that kicking and screaming. <laughs> so not always your dream to be a real estate developer? I didn't have a plan to do that. <laughs> okay. Well, throughout your career, it seemed to work out pretty well for you. Um, but you've gone through purchasing multiple locations and buildings that at time of purchase weren't always the most prosperous or profitable areas. And so what was it about these buildings or lands that you found a value in? Well, primarily we built uh, from the ground up. So most of uh, our development really were from the ground up. But we, we did do some uh, rehabbing of existing uh, buildings. What is it that you felt was the key for you to flip these areas and to make them so profitable? Well, obviously, uh, we were in the for-profit business, so we were trying to figure out how we were going to make a profit. Uh, but we were always very conscientious of the surroundings. So one of the things that we took great pride in in our development was to complement the surrounding area. So uh, most of our buildings were new buildings. And uh, one of the things that happens with uh, architects, I hope there aren't any architects uh, in, the, in the audience at the moment, but uh, celebrity architects, and we had the pleasure of being able to use some of the most famous architects in the country and the world. Uh, but they want their project to stand out, and they're not too concerned about the surrounding uh, projects. So one of the things we always prided ourselves on was to build something uh, that fit into the neighborhood. Uh, we were very, very strong about that, and, and to be wanted. And so we never went anywhere we were not wanted, which, which made getting the permits much easier. <laughs> so how is it that you built these properties and made it so appealing to the community? Was it based on the people in the area or the lifestyle in the area? No, well, pr primarily we were doing office buildings. Most of what we did was office buildings. So, and they were large office buildings a million feet or so so those are typically 50 60 stories high so we had to have large tenants so we had to go places where we could get large tenants uh, we for example did a lot of uh, development uh, with ibm as a joint venture partner and they would take say we were doing a million foot building they would take 500,000 feet so it made it easier to lease up the million feet. Oh, very nice. So your company throughout its existence has gone from <coughs> uh, private to public. So in that experience for you, at what point 
did you decide that it should become a public company? Uh, <laughs> it, capital is cheaper uh, in the public market, so uh, you, it always makes sense to, to be public uh, as of, you know, in the long run. may not be true at a particular moment, but generally uh, capital is cheaper and more plentiful. So that's the driving uh, force. Do you feel that you were able to pick that right moment for you? Yes, it worked out very well. Okay. Now, so with having the responsibility of developing majority or significant parts of the LA skyline, how is that for you now, looking and living there and looking at the skyline, knowing that so much of it is from you? Well, that's something I've always uh, said to myself is they can never take that away. <laughs> <laughs> now, so outside of this great success that you've had, what are some of the major challenges that you experienced throughout your career? Oh, geez. <laughs> How much time do we have? <laughs> as long as you want to be here. <laughs> it's your meal. Well, well there have uh, been challenges uh, just from day one. Uh, so I want to protect pick some particular time or phase in my life because uh, it's well, just been a series of challenges. More so in your, in your startup, startup years, yeah. how hard was it for you to kind of get your business off the ground and get it moving to become yeah. what it is? Yeah. So I have had three startups uh, in, in my uh, career. Uh, I was a partner in a major law firm in Los Angeles and uh, left that law firm and formed uh, my own law firm. And we started out with three attorneys and uh, we grew that firm to be 22 plus attorneys. Uh, and at the same time I was doing uh, uh, the real estate development. I had uh, joined with McGuire, and we had McGuire Thomas Partners. And so I had a double career doing real estate and uh, doing law, managing a law firm. Mm -hmm. And the real estate firm grew to be the largest uh, development firm at that point in time. And so I had to decide it was too much to keep doing two things. And so uh, I went into the real estate, so, but when I started the real estate, there were just two of us, mm -hmm. and so that grew. So that was number two startup, and, uh, and then uh, when that firm, uh, we split it up, and I started over with uh, about four or five people and grew that to several hundred people and big market cap. So. When you say, what are the challenges, when you've gone through three startups, there's more challenges than you want. But the thing I would say to the young people uh, in the audience, that uh, the, the lesson uh, that I would uh, say is persistence is really the key. So the key is when they knock you down, get back up. And so, that's the word, uh, that's the advice I would give. I've been knocked down a lot, but kept getting back up. That's great, I mean, that's great. That's how you end up where you are, and it's really nice to see that in someone so successful. You mentioned that it became too much for you at one point to have these two businesses. How did that affect your time and your family life on top oh, of geez, these businesses? Oh, you shouldn't ask that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think my wife would give me uh, A grades for, because uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, when you do so many things, something has to give. And uh, fortunately, I had a terrific wife who raised our kids, and I helped out a little, but uh, it was certainly not my strong suit. 
really great that you had a good partner in that, though. It would never have worked otherwise. So in your career, did you always dream and have this vision of a success in this business or in a success in your life and your career? No. You know, um, when, when I was uh, going to, uh, I got a basketball scholarship to Catawba when I finished high school. Uh, and uh, at, uh, after basketball was over the first season, my dad got ill, and uh, I had to come, he couldn't work, and I had to come home and uh, help support the family. Uh, and, uh, and then I went to school at night at uh, Baldwin Wallace, so when you're talking about challenges. Uh, and I worked at uh, Firestone Tire and Rubber Company warehouse, uh, loading trucks, refrigerators, tires, and uh, when I was working there, I had train winds. I, I had this dream. When you say, did you ever have a dream? This is the only time I remember really having a goal and saying that I wanted to do something. And my, my goal was, if I could ever make $5,000 a year, I would be on uh, really great. That was my goal. That's the last goal I remember setting was getting to five thousand dollars a year. Okay, I'd say you achieve that. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is it that made you want to bring your success back to your hometown in Pembroke and start developing places here? Well, I have uh, always uh, realized that. Uh, my success, anything that I, it's not really uh, my sole achievement. I'm really standing on the shoulders of, of people and institutions that have gone before me. And so uh, I felt like it's a responsibility to, to give back because uh, what I, the luck I've had is in large part attributable to people who've gone before me. Hmm. You say the luck that you've had. How much of your success do you chalk up to luck versus your own hard work? Well, the luck's the key. The hard, the hard work, you, you gotta put in the hard work if you're starting from where I was starting at least. Uh, but you gotta have luck too. Now, with bringing your success back here to your hometown, what ideally is your vision for Pembroke? Uh, well, my vision of Pembroke is in 1952 when we moved away, I, that's my vision of Pembroke. And so downtown Pembroke was a thriving place. Uh, the stores across the street here, all of this was thriving and uh, Every uh, Saturday night, for example, everyone would come into town. Uh, and so that's the picture that I have of Pembroke, is that picture that when I left. And that's what I want to see again. Okay. Now that's a very different experience and vision than what you have developed in, in Los Angeles with your high-rise buildings. Now, how do you feel about developing in a smaller town and developing smaller buildings? Do you find a greater joy in that or prefer high-rise? Developing is hard. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing is that uh, a small project is just as hard as a big one. So the uh, the disadvantage is when you're building a big project, there's bigger scale and bigger financial opportunity. You do a smaller project, it's just as hard, but the upside is smaller, so. So what is it about real estate development that really attracted you to it? Well, I think I commented on that before tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I really can't. No, but, uh, it's, uh, 
the great thing about it is uh, doing things that, uh, that last. Mm -hmm. So uh, being able to do projects that serve the community that, uh, and that uh, you can look at with pride that you've done something uh, that not only benefits you financially, but is good for the community that you've, you've uh, worked in. That's really nice. Now, you mentioned that you had played basketball before, and in doing some research about your life, I found out that you had owned, at some at, for a few years actually, had owned the Sacramento Kings back in California. Um, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, if I have my dates wrong, from 92 to 99, correct. you owned the Kings. Yeah. So what was it that you wanted, that drove you to get into NBA ownership? Well, um, it was, uh, it was uh, having played basketball, and uh, it happened that development goes in spurts. So in the late 90s, uh, or late 80s, early 90s, uh, development was, uh, there was no real development to do. And so I was looking around for something to do, and so I thought about, well, she's owning a sports team, that would be fun. <laughs> and, uh, and so it was like a boyhood dream come true, having, so uh, I've been a big uh, Laker fan, going to all the Laker games, and, and being very much a sports person. When I was here in Pembroke, I played every sport. I played football, baseball, basketball, year round. So I've always been into sports. And so the opportunity to own a professional basketball team was quite nice. So how did you end up owning the Kings out of all teams? Well, I looked around, I went to, when I decided to uh, buy a team, I looked at I looked at football, baseball, hockey, and basketball to just from a business viewpoint to see what would make the most sense business-wise. And at that time, basketball had the best player contract, and that's the most important thing in terms of uh, hoping to make any money at the sports. And, uh, and so then I, uh, I met with the commissioner and uh, told him of my interest and asked him, you know, what teams I might talk to. And he gave me four or five teams to talk to. And so it wound up that uh, uh, Sacramento had a couple of things in addition to a basketball team. There, they had an arena, and I wanted to own my own arena, and so uh, that was good. And the other thing was, being a developer, there was 9,000 undeveloped acres around uh, Arco Center, so that got my attention, too. So, so did you end up developing in those areas? It, well, it was in, 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 the reason that they were undeveloped was an our environmental issue that I was hoping would get solved. but. It, it didn't. Oh, okay. Now, as a fan of the sport, how is it juggling personally being a fan and being an owner at the same time? It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the reason I sold the team was, I guess, because I was too much of a fan, because I lived and died with, uh, with the team. So if the team won, I was on a high, and if the team lost, I was on a low. And I didn't like the uh, fact that you had, uh, my wife hates me to say this, but <laughs> it just bothered me that I had five people running around in short pants that determined whether I was going to be in a good mood or not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
well, that might change things a little bit. <laughs> um, so in doing in selling the team, how did it come to you choosing who you were going to sell it to? Is it just well, I wasn't looking to sell the team. Uh, and uh, some people came to me and expressed interest. And so I, since I wasn't in, you know, planning to sell, I just said, well, here's a, I didn't say to them, but I thought a ridiculous price. And I said, there's no negotiation. If you want to pay me that, then that's fine. Otherwise, we have nothing to talk about. And they paid the price, and so it was too good a deal to turn down. Oh. It's always nice when you don't think they'll take it, and they still do. <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's, that's, uh, to be in a strong negotiating point is always nice. Doesn't happen a lot for developers. <laughs> so as a business leader, you mentioned earlier the, your, some of your advice, but outside of that, are there any other little nuggets of wisdom that you would share with any aspiring entrepreneur? Well, I think there's some basic things just about human life in, in general that apply to business. And uh, first and foremost, for, for everyone, I think your most precious thing is your reputation. And you want to think about yourself as someone that you can be proud of and uh, try to live your life as best you can in that regard. And so uh, as uh, being a leader of a, of a company and setting the values of the company, it starts at the top. And you want to set that example of having the reputation, and that was always important to me, and, and I tried to set that kind of example for, for the company and the employees and for the reputation uh, in the business. So we had the reputation that, uh, for example, when we were uh, building a building, your, uh, most people can't envision what a building's going to look like or what it's going to be. So if you're building a million foot building, uh, you start three years before uh, this is going to be complete, at least three to five years. So you're trying to line up tenants to go somewhere three to five years later. And so one of the important things for us was that we had a reputation in the industry that people knew that we would build a quality project and we would be good landlords. And so having a good reputation would allow us to pre-lease uh, these large buildings and that's how you finance them is by pre-leasing them. Okay. Now from your startup stage to your large public company stage, how did your leadership change in those terms? Well, I just took on a bunch of new bosses, <laughs> shareholders. <laughs> Spread it out a bit, make it yeah. a little easier? Yeah, well, being a public company is, there's a lot of regulations, a lot of reporting, uh, and uh, it, uh, it, the accrual accounting which they use for public companies really doesn't fit real estate very well. Real estate's really a cash flow business and uh, accrual accounting is not, I don't want to get too technical for, for the audience, but it sort of makes it complicated because as, as a business person, I always was looking at what's the cash, you know, what is, and accrual accounting, did you look at this? And so uh, that's a challenge for, for real estate companies and trying to, the public reporting uh, really isn't very conducive to, to real estate companies. So while you came back here to Pembroke to 
share your success here and with the university. What is it about UNCP and their education that has inspired you to be such a large benefactor of the, of the university? The chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> And I, and I mean that in more ways than one. I, I think he's doing such a terrific job. Uh, and uh, I really want to uh, see him succeed. And uh, so, and then he's a bulldog. He gets on your case. <laughs> persistence. Yeah, persistence, that's the key. So, we, for those of us that work here in the center and in the incubator, we have the pleasure and honor every day of telling people how we work in the Thomas Center for Entrepreneurship. How has your knowledge and success been able to drive the community or the entrepreneurs who are here that get to be in the incubator, who are taking this opportunity, how does that affect your own feeling towards these centers and pushing mm -hmm. entrepreneurship? Well, it, uh, it was, seems clear to me, uh, you know, I'm not here, so I'm certainly not an expert uh, on the area, but you don't have a lot of large uh, industry, and uh, it seemed to me that you really, uh, if the community was going to be successful in a big way, you were sort of going to have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And uh, so that, to me, uh, meant that uh, you would, one thing that would be very, very helpful would be uh, to get people to be more entrepreneurial. Uh, and having gone through, as I said before, three startups. Uh, and I just saw that uh, when I had the opportunity to uh, start an entrepreneur center here, I thought it made a lot of sense. I thought it would be something that would be very useful for the uh, community. And so I was excited to have the opportunity and privilege and to be able to do it. Well, for those of us who get to experience that every day, we're definitely very grateful for it. Thank you. And so I just want to thank you for being here with us today and allowing me to go through all of my questions and all the things I wanted to know about you. Um, and I'd like... I wish I had better answers. <laughs> <laughs> I think they were great. Um, but I'd like to open it up to see if anyone else has any questions for him. Hello. Okay. Thank you for being here as an entrepreneur who's benefited greatly from this facility and operation we have here. I'd like to say thank you very much for making this possible. Um, my question is about scalability. You talked about it earlier. Um, from getting a business, kind of first business being born, being a toddler, uh, how do you get it to be an adult? How do you get a business to be sustainable and then scale it from there? What are the keys? Well, I, the key is one, to be doing something that you have some talent to do. Uh, and, and then working hard at it. If you uh, have a passion for it and you work hard and persistent, uh, and as I said before, you're going to meet with failures and, and the key is when you fail that you don't give up, they knock you down, you get back up, and I mean, I, to me, that was a mental vision that I had. I just, when things went wrong, I always thought about it visually, is that I, someone had just landed a haymaker and knocked me down, and I was gonna get back up. Anybody else? I no. enjoyed your talk. Uh, one thing struck me, uh, you said early, you talked about uh, you ended up Can you parlay that into some advice for students who are planning their careers? Uh, do, should they be expecting to take wild turns that maybe they weren't anticipating? Yeah, uh, I think it, you know, it varies from, from people. Uh, 
when I went to, uh, when I started college, I was going to be a doctor. I took biology. We had to dissect the fetal pig, I believe it was. Then that, I moved on. <laughs> that was, it was, became clear that was not for me. So then I was going to be a math teacher and then I took calculus or something and that was not for me. And so for me, uh, it was uh, trial and error. The, I did not decide to be a lawyer until uh, I was a junior uh, in, in college. So I went through a lot of different things before I decided that, that I really wanted to be a lawyer. That really appealed to me. And I enjoyed practicing law, uh, but law changed uh, during the time I practiced. I actually practiced law for 20 years because after the real estate, when I went into real estate, I had the dual career. But when I started practicing law, it was a profession. And uh, you dealt with one another, other lawyers on a professional basis. But it then turned into a business. So now you have these giant law firms, thousand lawyers, and that had started to happen. So law was sort of, it was moving in that direction. And so law was not, it got to be not as satisfying as it had been when I started the profession. And so then by happen chance, the real estate opportunity came along. So I was ripe for doing something else. Uh, even though uh, I wasn't sure that it was real estate, I went into it uh, uh, just not knowing whether that was going to turn out to be a good thing, but it, it did. So I think the, that there, the lesson, I think, is that for young people is that uh, if you really know what you want to do, and you, you know, some people say from eight, uh, when I was eight years old, I wanted to be a doctor, and I did that. And then there are other people who, you know, just really can't decide what they want to do. And I don't think you should panic. I think you should just keep trying different things. And I think, uh, I think it will work out mostly. So that, that's how I look at it. We got time for one more question. If anyone, no? So Jim, I met you and Jack Lowry at the hotel a few years ago. We had a great conversation. Could you relate the story about how you ended up in Catawba in Pembroke? Oh. I, which part? So, <laughs> There's a lot of parts. Oh, hitchhiking to hitchhiking. hitchhiking, yeah. We went to. Uh, so, the folks, we being Jack Lowry and Jim Thomas standing on Highway 74 hitchhiking to Catawba, correct? <laughs> yes. That's how I got I'd there. I'd love to meet the man who picked you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I did a lot of hitchhiking back then. <laughs> well, hopefully you didn't hitchhike all the way over here. But, <laughs> but we'd like to thank you for being so willing to come here and talk to us and share your story and your inspiration with the community again. And if everyone could just join me in a round of applause, I really appreciate yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you.